I had always been interested in questions of social justice as a college student and the intersection between social justice and environmental health. My name is Rachel morello Frosch, and I am a professor at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. I'm known for doing work on social determinants of environmental health disparities and what kinds of social drivers affect how different population groups come in contact with chemicals, air pollution, and other environmental hazards. Firefighting has traditionally been a predominantly, until recently, a white male dominated occupation. So I had worked at the civil rights organization that had worked so hard to get the consent decree so that women could get into the fire department shortly after college. So fast forward several decades later, I get to witness how much progress had been made in terms of the number of women within the San Francisco Fire Department. But now they were facing a new challenge, this challenge of, of breast cancer in the workplace. It posed a challenge to me as a scientist to figure out how can we study it together in a way that's meaningful to them and that will get us actionable results that people could do something about now. In the field of environmental justice research, for a long time the question was studying how certain populations are disproportionately exposed to environmental hazards. For example, environmental justice advocates have always said hazardous waste facilities, industrial facilities are disproportionately located where they live uh, compared to their white wealthier counterparts in terms of neighborhoods. White people who live in more segregated cities are better off than their people of color counterparts within those cities. But those white folks are much worse off than their white counterparts who live in less segregated cities. So there's something about segregation that makes air quality worse for everybody because in more segregated cities, people are more physically separated from the things that they need to access every day, their jobs, basic services, and things like that. They have to drive longer distances. And that makes the regional air quality worse off for everyone. Given the short time frame in which these rates and new cases have changed, our gene pool doesn't change that quickly. So I'm not convinced that genes really explains these patterns that we're seeing. So to what extent are other things like chronic exposure to psychosocial stressors like poverty, like stress of everyday encounters with discrimination that you might not even realize you have but you're, because you're so used to uh, dealing with it every day that it starts to degrade your immune system in ways that might make you more vulnerable to things that might cause cancer. And then to what extent do disparities and exposures to environmental hazards like environmental chemicals and other things that might play out by race and class explain these observed uh, differences in the patterns that we see in risk of getting breast cancer and also risk of dying of it. I have had breast cancer, so I started graduate school in the same year that I started my treatment for breast cancer. Although I never planned to become a breast cancer researcher, that was not gonna be the focus of my work. But I think breast cancer research kind of found its way back to me. When you affected by a disease like breast cancer, you're asking yourself, uh, how is it that I'm a statistical anomaly? It's very unusual to get this kind of a disease at such a young age. Are there things that happened in my life or that I was exposed to that might explain why I got the disease at such a young age? It, it's no longer just theoretical, but you're also kind of thinking about this at a very sort of personal level as you go through your education. We are exposed to a huge array of environmental chemicals without our permission. And increasingly we're seeing how that affects our health and how it affects the health of our children. Environmental policy making needs to get better so that we have more agency in preventing that form of toxic trespass and not having to be exposed to these things without our permission. It's unfortunate that we are in this situation where there's a proliferation of environmental chemicals in everyday products that we come encounter with, in the things that we use in our bodies, and the things that we use in our homes, in our workplaces, that we have no control over as individuals. There's little individual actions we can take, but what it really boils down to is that environmental policy making and regulation has failed us, and we're still subjected every day to toxic trespass. And that to me is the call for arms and what we want to do in terms of leveraging the results of our scientific work to push for policy change and end toxic trespass. My end goal is to 
have policy that actually protects people from unsafe chemicals in everyday products so that we can be assured that the ingredients have been adequately tested and that it doesn't harm health or that if it does, we can make informed decisions about whether or not we want to use the product. My second end goal is to finally do something and be a leader in climate change. I want people to get involved, whether that means joining an environmental organization or writing a letter to your representative or educating yourself about what's going on and just learn about some of the things that are working well out there and try and get involved in them. If you want to sort of take the next step is you can get involved in environmental policy campaigns to improve chemicals policy. These are what we know are going on in, in your community that you might want to connect with. Or it can be as simple as making sure you're registered to vote and when you're evaluating candidates, what's their environmental record? What do they think about chemicals policy? Maybe that should inform the decision that you make about who you vote for the next time you go to the ballot box.